Amen. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be reading one of the most famous, some people believe the most infamous, some people believe the most blessed, and other people believe the most controversial passage of Scripture on the family. So if you'll open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5, I want to begin with verse 21. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her with having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall become one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. This is a mystery, it's profound, and I'm saying that this refers to Christ and the church, however... Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. And fathers, do not provoke, do not exasperate your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline, the nurture and discipline and instruction of the Lord. Well, the family uh, is going through a pretty difficult time these days. And on this Mother's Day, I just want to talk to you about the mechanics of the family. Recently, we had some work done on our car, and we took it to a mechanic. And uh, the mechanic we take it to is really well-trained, uh, lots of experience. And not only does he have experience, but uh, on occasion, you know, he'll have to pull out the book and to see how things are structured so that he can do the mechanical work on the car that needs to be done. And that's what we need to do with the family. Um, the family is going through a really difficult time. All the statistics tell us this in many ways. For example, um, Fewer people are getting married these days, and those who do get married don't stay married as long as they used to stay married, and people who do get married uh, have fewer kids, and uh, we're disconnected from each other. We are a mobile society, so not only are we having internal difficulties sometimes in the family, but we don't have the support system that we need to have a family, and sometimes we have family out of town and uh, we don't have that support system. And, and, and on top of all this, um, secular society really doesn't appreciate and love the family. Uh, believe it or not, when I was preparing for this message, I pulled up my uh, copy of Karl Marx's and Frederick Engels' Communist Manifesto. And uh, those of you know, in our country, there are a certain segments that are dealing with uh, socialism or communism. They're kind of cousins. And one of the things that Karl Marx suggested about the family, believe it or not, was that the family was simply just a, a way to oppress people in a bourgeois kind of way, that the ruling class loved the family because it keep, kept people oppressed. Here's what they know about the family that is so true. The family has a conserving, preserving moral nature to it in general. And so many times the reason that uh, secular progressives love to see the breakup of the family is because they know that they can uh, indoctrinate and educate 
those children to think differently about authority, about relationships, about all of those things that are really important. But, but it doesn't matter what Karl Marx thinks. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what you think. Uh, I want to know what the mechanics book says. What does the Word of God say about the family? Uh, recently, because of this uh, season that we're in with the virus, we've been spending a lot of time with our families. I hope that's been good for you. Uh, some people may think, man, we've, we've spent a whole lot of time together and I don't know whether I like my family or not, but I hope that's not been the case with you. And uh, we've been wondering, we've been trying to figure this out. How does family work God's way? So here's what we're going to do. If you want to take out a, a pencil, a note, paper, I'm going to give you five priorities in the family. So we're going we're gonna to fly over this text at about 50,000 feet. And then I'm going to give you five responsibilities, and we're going to go real low into this text. So we're going to fly above it and take some general principles on how the family, the mechanics of the family, ought to work. So you want to write these down. Five priorities and five principles on how the family ought to work. So, so here's, here's principle number one, the priority number one of a family that God makes. This is what the mechanic says. This is what God says from his word. Number one, that the most important person in your home, in your family, ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in this text, he uses references that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, I believe it's verse 17, right before he tells them that they are to love their wife, respect their husband, raise their children in a godly way, he says, let everything that you do be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the glory of the Father. And so the most important person in your home is not you, not your kids, uh, not the grandparents, not mom, not dad. The most important person in your home ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the honored guest. And in, and in, and in practical ways, that means that we honor him in our home through the word, through prayer, through Bible stories. But I, I have found it, it's more of an attitude. It's more of a, the air that you breathe in your home. So priority number one, that Jesus ought to be master and Lord in your home. Here's the second priority. The most, if the most important person in the home is the Lord Jesus Christ, now get this, the most important relationship in the home is between the husband and wife. Now you would expect me to say between the parents and the children, that's coming, but here's one thing I think the Bible teaches and one thing I think is good for children, and that is that if mom and dad are okay, probably everybody else is going to be okay. So the most important relationship in the home is between the husband and wife. In fact, we know in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that God made them male and female, and he, he made them so that they can, he made them the same in his image in many ways, but different in kind in some ways so that he could make them one in the most important way. Then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God, when he looked at his creation, he said, it's not good that a person, a man, be alone. So he created a helpmate for Adam called Eve, the mother of all living things. And he put them together and he said, a, a man shall leave his father and mother and, and leave his family and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh, and that's a one flesh, multi-dimensional thing, emotional, physically, spiritually, sexually, every which way, oneness. And that is, that's base camp, to use a military term, that is base camp for the family. Mom and dad, husband and wife, in partnership with each other. That's why it's interesting in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, when he begins this passage here talking about marriage, he begins it with a double submission. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he's going to go on and talk about how the husband, in a way, submits to his wife, and that's his, he leads her 
through sacrificial service, and she submits to her husband by following his, his lead. And so you have this, this priority of the husband and wife. Let me, let me give you a promise. If you get this out of, out of balance, if the kids become the priority, I know the kids may take the most time, but if the kids become the priority, when the kids walk out the door, the grandkids walk out the door, then you're left with your spouse, and you better know your spouse, and you better love your spouse if you want to have a long time together. And so if the most important person in your home ought to be Jesus, and the most important relationship in your home ought to be between the mom and the dad, the most important responsibility in home, this is priority number three, are the kids. That is if God so blesses. Uh, kids are not in the way. Now, we have uh, moved in our culture that kids, kids are, are uh, we, we love them, but they're kind of a nuisance, and they keep us from getting to what we really need to get to. And the Bible doesn't have anything to do with that. The Bible tells us that our kids, if God gives them to us, they are the mission that he has given us. And everything else is, is, is side stuff. The Bible says in Psalm 127, verse 3, that children are an inheritance from the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 22, 6 says that we are to raise our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We are to raise them, teach a child, train up a child when he, in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not deport, depart from it. De Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 says that we are to instruct our children in the law that we're to teach them while we're rising up and lying down and while we're sitting down and while we're eating we're just to be discipling our children that is priority number three priority number four is this that that the most important duty in the home is the spiritual and moral formation of everybody in the home so if jesus is the lord of the home and the most important relationship on earth is between mom and dad, and the most important responsibility is the nurturing of children, it, goes, it, it just goes to the fact that the most important duty of the home is the spiritual and moral formation of everybody in the home. I, I liken the family to this. The family is one of God's beautiful means of grace. And what I mean by the means of grace is God gives us all kinds of things to form us into the image of His Son. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what God does is God has uh, the means that He uses for this. He, it's the Word of God, prayer, worship, fellowship, mission. And I also believe the family is a means of grace. In fact... Being a part of a family is the most sanctifying, revealing uh, process you could ever have in your life. Family will teach you how self-centered you are. Uh, family will teach you how long you need to go to grow to become more like Jesus. It will be in the incubator of the family where God takes His sandpaper of grace and wears off the rough edges that all of us have. And that's one of the priorities of the family, is the moral and spiritual formation of everybody in the family, not just the kids, but also mom and dad. They're going to be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, so as a matter of fact, that means that everybody in the family is in a sense discipling everybody in the family. Let me give you a final priority, and that is the priority that if Jesus is the most important person in your home, if the relationship between the mom and the dad is the most important relationship, if the most important responsibility is the discipleship of the kids, and if the most important duty in the home is the spiritual and moral formation of everybody in the home, then the Bible tells us that the most important goal of the family is cultural stability and the glory of God. Cultural stability. Now think about that. When the family goes well, it doesn't cost us as much in our culture. 
When the family goes well, things tend to go well with mom and dad and kids. When the family goes well, it, it's good for everybody involved, not just people in the family, but our culture. And all of that brings glory to God. So those are priorities. Now that's at 50,000 feet, so here's the responsibility. How does that work out? How, how do we do that? How do we let Jesus be Lord? How do we work on our relationships in in our marriage? How do we disciple our kids? How do we spiritually form each other into the image of Jesus Christ? And how do we bring cultural stability and, and glorify God in our family? Well, here it is. It's right here in this text. So, so here's the roles or the responsibilities. Here it is. Let me repeat. Here's number one. The role is that Jesus Christ is Lord. All through Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21, all the way down to verse 34 and even into chapter 6, Jesus is the central character. We are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. We are to, we are to nourish each other. We are to, to do all of these things as a reflection of who Jesus is. So, and again, I'm repeating the priority must become a responsibility, and that is that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's a second responsibility, and that is the leadership of the husband. The Bible says in verses 25 down to verse 31 that husbands are to lead their families. Now, I'm going to get to the submission part, which is a really controversial part, but I want to begin with husbands. The Bible calls us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. So the call to, for the wife to submit only to her husband, she hasn't, doesn't submit to every man, but she does submit to her husband. Well, what kind of husband should she be willing to submit to? Now, sometimes people have taken this word submission and made it sound like a tyrant, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says right here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 and following, listen to these words. Husbands, we're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, we're to give ourselves as Christ gave to us. We are to sanctify our wives. That is, we're to set her apart as something holy and precious. We are to live, love her uh, as we love ourselves. And some of us really love ourselves. And we're to love our, our, our spouses as we love ourselves, to care for her, to nourish her, to cherish her, to, to sec secure her, to serve her, to present her without spot or, or blemish. That is, that just like we're presenting a beautiful bride on the day of her wedding, we husbands are to lead our families, in particular our, our wives, in this way, just like Christ leads His church. Doesn't sound like a tyrant to me. Now, there are some husbands that take this role of leadership in their home and they, they abuse it and they misunderstand it. It doesn't mean that the husband makes every decision. It doesn't mean that, that he, uh, nobody else has any word. That's not the word here for leadership, and we'll get into that. But husbands, we're to lead. And, and the problem, now we'll get to the problem of the wife, but the problem of the husband is the same problem generally with men. We, we like to play. If we, we, we sometimes find it difficult to get under the responsibility of leading our homes. And so just like there will be jokes that ought not to be made about women who will not submit, who are rebellious in their spirit, who are dominating, who are mean-spirited, it, it is equally true, in fact, even more true, that we men sometimes don't like to get up under the spiritual responsibility of what it means to lead our families. And that's going to look different in every family. I know what it looks like in my family, but I do have a responsibility to lead my family, to point them in a direction, to set the tone, to, to set the example, to, to take everything into consideration and to, to do that in a loving and godly way. In fact, 
Uh, the Bible talks about this submission, if you will, this order of creation in 1 Corinthians 11 where it says that God, the Father, is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of the man and, and the man is the head of every woman or the head of a woman. And this is beautiful in God's sight. Now stick with me on that one. Th then it comes to the woman. So here's the responsibility. If it's a responsibility that Christ is Lord... And if it's responsibility that men are to lead, the Bible talks about the, the word here that women are to submit to their husbands. Now, this is really controversial, but I think it's misunderstood. It doesn't mean that she's not as smart as her husband. In fact, I just want to guarantee you that there's a lot of you out there that know your wife is smarter than you are. It doesn't mean that uh, a wife has no say. It doesn't mean any of that. It simply means that she willingly brings herself into the alignment with her husband as he sets, as they set, the spiritual direction of their family. And one of the illustrations for this word of hypostasis, or it's, it means to get up under, it's used 38 times in the New Testament. And literally what it means, it means to bring willingly, not, not being browbeaten, but it means willingly bringing themselves under the authority of another. And it's interesting, it was once used in the term of, of generals who were of equal rank, and yet all of those generals decided that there would be one who would be first among equals. And that one particular general would take all the other generals' comments into, into account. And then when it came time to, to unpack the attack plan, that one general, they knew that on the battlefield, you can't have 15 generals saying 15 different things. And so all those people of equal rank, valued in the image of God, would submit their, their, themselves to the one general as the first among equals, and he would lead the charge knowing that he had the care of everybody under him. And that's what it means to submit. So get this in the home. How does this work out? It says that in, in, in verse 22, it says that wives were to submit unto their husbands, and husbands are to love their wives. And uh, it's interesting, I, I've done a lot of marriages in my life, done a lot of marriage counseling, and I've asked this question often of uh, some very strong, intellectual, well-educated women, I've asked this one question. I said, if you had a man in your life who desperately, passionately, frantically loved you like Jesus loved you, loves you, if you had a man in your life it, that, you, that you knew wanted you to blossom and grow into all that God wanted you to be, if you had a man in your life who would literally lay himself down for you, would you follow his lead? And I've never been told no. Never one time, even up to the year 2020. In fact, I had one lady tell me one time who was a very strong woman. She's her fiancé is sitting in my office or getting marriage counseling, and she looked at me, she said, where is that man? So I had to go to work on him to try to get him to bow up and lead his family and lead his new wife. Now, here's what's interesting about this, these roles before we move on to these other priorities and these responsibilities, how to make family work. If Jesus is the Lord and husbands are loving their wives as Christ loved the church, and if the spouse, if the wife is willingly submitting herself, all that she is to support that, to be a part of that, to put that together, then I just want to make this really strong statement. For every lady out there who's listening to this and say, I, I don't, this, this is old fashioned, I just want to say this to you. You have the easier part. I just want to say this to you. Submission to another is difficult. In fact, Jesus and the Word of God anticipated this. In Genesis chapter 3, when Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve, the byproduct of the conflict between the roles of men and women was right there. In fact, when God cursed the earth and he cursed Satan and he cursed Adam um, for not covering his wife and she gets uncovered and falls into sin, and the Word of God says that 
God looked at Eve and said, your, your desire will be to dominate your husband, but he will rule over you. And right there is where marriage counseling began. But I want to say this to you husbands. If God calls your wife to lovingly and willingly submit, he calls you to die. Not to dominate, to die. Because the Bible says, right here in the Word of God, that we are to love our wife as Christ of the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, he hasn't called you to go play without responsibility. He hasn't called you to put your thumb on your wife. He's called you to die for her so that she might be presented as a beautiful bride, spotless, nourished, cherished. That's leadership. That's the way God works. Here, here's something else. The Bible tells us, how does this work in the family? If the responsibilities of the roles are the lordship of Christ and the leadership of the husband and the fellowship of the wife, then it's the obedience of children. Now, I know you're laughing right now, the obedience of children. Somebody asked me one time, they said, Pastor, do you believe in demon possession? I said, yes, all three of my kids were demon possessed at one time or another. Raising children is a messy, difficult, challenging, but blessed thing. I want to state again that children are not in your way. Children are not in your way. I've committed this sin. You know, you get busy with your life, you have priorities, you got things you want to accomplish, and all of a sudden the rugrats are around you and, and there's busy and you're, you're flustered and all this stuff. Don't ever forget that these are a heritage of the Lord. This is the mission. This is the mission. Now, here in Ephesians chapter 6, after he gets done talking to the husbands and wives about their role, then he says, children, obey your parents. In the Lord, that's really the only way to do this. And it says this is the first promise that comes, this first commandment that comes with a promise. So of the Ten Commandments, this is one of the few commandments that comes with a promise that it may go well with you to honor your father and mother, to be obedient. Well, how does that happen? Well, it says in verse 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't exasperate them. Don't frustrate them but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So to two sides of the same coin. We are to raise our children with both negative and positive reinforcement. We are to raise them in the Lord in both, with both negative and positive reinforcement. And that means discipline, and it also means reward. And that happens in a godly home. There's one final thing I want to tell you this, and that is... The, 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 fifth, the fifth responsibility, and that is this, to present this beautiful thing called the family as a gift to God. Now stick with me here. Here in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that husbands, we're to love our wives, wives submit to their husbands, and this works good when we're leaning into the Lord. And the Bible says that we are to present her, our wives, as, as a beautiful bride spotless, pure. Now, stick with me here, and I don't think this is too much of a stretch. I believe that every person will be held accountable for what they do individually. I believe that. We are each stand on our own. Everybody in your family, in the end, ultimately, stands on their own. I can't choose to believe for my wife. She can't believe for me. I can't believe for my children, my grandchildren. So in a sense, we are each accountable. But in another sense, I believe that we each, especially in the family, will be held to some degree, held to account for those in our family. Not in a condemning way, but I, I really believe, for example, that when I get to heaven, I will be judged not just because of what I have believed and what I have done, but my responsibility as a husband to prepare my wife to meet Jesus. And so in that sense, in the family, we all share in this responsibility of presentation that glorifies God. So you get those roles. How do the priorities 
The most important person in your home is the Lord Jesus. The most important relationship is mom and dad. The most important responsibility is kids, if God has blessed you with them, maybe even grandkids down the line you're helping raise. The most important duty is to spiritual and moral formation. The most important gift that we give is cultural stability and the glorification of God. How does that happen? It happens as we make Christ Lord on a daily basis, as we lead our families as husbands, as we partner and follow as spouses, as we raise our kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And all of that brings to present a family to God. An amazing thing. Now, I'm going to say something to you as I close that is totally counterintuitive to everything I've just told you. You and I can't do anything that I've just told you on your own. I I can't make Jesus Lord on my own in the sense that I just kind of boss him around and he's Lord one day and he's not. I I can't love my wife as Christ loved the church on my own. You can't submit to leadership and authority on your own. You can't obey Christ and honor your mom and dad on your own. We cannot present ourselves to God as a, as a glorious part of His bride, the church, on our own. We can't do it. Unless, unless we lean into the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the one, the one overarching priority, the priority of all priorities, you have these five priorities and you have these five responsibilities or roles, and that's the gospel. The gospel must invade your family. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the continuing grace of the gospel that, that causes me to be able to forgive people in my family or to be forgiven by them. The gospel of Jesus Christ that reconciles broken relationships between moms and dads and prodigals. That, that's the gospel. The gospel is not just something that, that Billy Graham preaches in a, in, a, in a stadium. That's all good. The gospel is not just something that the preacher stands and preaches in the pulpit. But the gospel is something that invades our home so that we can live at peace with each other. The gospel teaches me as a husband that Christ leads his church by laying down his life for his church. The gospel teaches women, smart, educated, willing women, to submit themselves to the authority for the glory of Christ. The gospel teaches children to honor their parents as a part of the gospel of how they honor God the Father. This is all the gospel. So I don't want you to think as you sit there this morning and you watch this, say, gosh, I, there's no way I can do this. I'm not doing this very good now. I have good news for you. The gospel of Jesus Christ can enable all of us to do all of this for his glory. You know, there's something about the family. Isn't it interesting that prior to God even creating a people, Israel, Genesis 12, he created a family. And in that family, God wanted there to be love and discipleship and all of these things together. Now, I know some of you who are listening to me don't have children. I know maybe your children have grown. Or maybe you're single And I could preach a whole message on being single. The Bible has a lot to say about singleness. In fact, Jesus Christ was single. And the contribution that single people make to the kingdom of God. But this message, this message was for the family. And I just want to encourage you that the way to get on track with your family is not to fix your husband, not to fix your wife, not to fix your kids. The way to begin is by submitting yourself out of reverence for Christ. In fact, this passage in Ephesians chapter 5 can be totally understood and really embraced if you look at verse 21. It says, 
Paul's talking about our new life in Christ, you know what he says? He says this. Submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes, what's the first application of it? In the family. How does the husband submit? He dies. How does the wife submit? She follows. How do the kids submit? They obey. And it all happens because of the gospel. Could I speak to you husbands? If you don't know Christ, if you're wondering, I, I want to be a good dad, I want to be a good father, I, I want to lead my family in a loving, godly way, I, I don't want to be a tyrant, I, I want to I be that kind of shepherd, that pastor of my family. How can I do that? It begins with the gospel. And, and dear lady, precious mom, you might be thinking, gosh, I feel like such a failure. The kids are running around. I, I, my husband and I are talking well. We don't get along. It begins with the gospel. So to every person who knows Christ, go back to the gospel. Go back to the gospel. And for every one of you who don't know Christ, you may be listening on this Mother's Day, this Lord's Day. This may be replayed five years from now. Here's what I want you to hear. It all begins with the gospel. And you say, well, Pastor, what's the gospel? The gospel is this. The gospel is there's God. And God loves you. And God visited us in the person of Jesus Christ. He was sinless, spotless. He came, born of a virgin. He died on a cross. And on that cross, he paid for the sins of everyone who would ever believe. That could be you. He was raised from the dead. And he ascended to the Father, and now he intercedes for all of his children, and one day he'll return. Well, you say, Pastor, what do I need to do? What do I need to how do, how do I start this? Well, the Bible says that first you repent. Repent means to acknowledge your sin, that you're genuinely remorseful, you're sorry for it, but not just that. Repentance means to turn away. You're going to turn away from your sin. That's the first thing. And then you're going to look to Jesus. You're going to look at what he has done for you, that he can forgive you of your sins. He can give you a brand new heart. He will give you new birth. And the way you do that is by placing your faith and trust in not only who Jesus is, but what he did on the cross in paying for your sins and being raised from the dead. And any person, Romans 10, 13, who calls upon that Jesus shall be saved. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. And I want to call you to repent and have faith in Christ. Would you pray this? You bow your heads right now. When some people trust Christ, sometimes they'll pray something like this, and you might want to pray along with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I repent in great sorrow over my sin. I turn from it. And I want to receive this gift of love in Jesus Christ. That he died for me. He took my penalty, my death, and I want to trust him as my Lord and Savior. Father, there will be hundreds of people listening today, and their family is a mess. And um, they are frustrated, they are guilt ridden. They think they're alone. Many of them think they're so far in that there's no way to change. There's no hope. And, and I pray, Father, that in this moment, you would give them the hope that the priorities of a family and the responsibilities or the roles in, this, in, the, in the family are not impossible. But it doesn't mean that we, we accomplish it in our own power. We turn over a new leaf. We try to straighten each other out. We, we start pointing the finger. It, it literally means that we drop to our knees, that we start humbly asking for your help, surrendering ourselves to you, to submit ourselves to you, Jesus. And I pray that you would save to the other end. Father, there are dads watching right now who need to be saved. There are moms watching right now who need to be saved. There may be children watching who need to be saved. And I pray that today on this Mother's Day, you would save them 
help them through your spirit realize they need a Savior. And Lord, would you just enable them to turn from their sins? Enable them by your enabling, convicting Holy Spirit of God to have faith in Christ and save them. And let it be a new beginning for their family. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name and for the sake of the family. Amen.